Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, Empowered Living Club educational meeting and to our uh, session or our series, I guess I would say, on perspectives on aging in place, uh, of staying at home, what's it like, et cetera, et cetera, uh, longer. Uh, today's session is, are you a family member or are you a caregiver or what combination? Uh, this, the, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's, as I said, a current series. It's called Aging in Place, How to Stay Home Longer, a uh, series of discussions with industry experts, which provide some hopefully unique and empowering insights. And I can tell you uh, that we've had them, we're into about our sixth or seventh session, and we've had some good ones. They are available on the, on the club uh, website. Uh, as I say, today's perspective is, are you a family member or a caregiver? And that certainly goes along with, you know, keeping yourself or keeping mom home, whoever mom is. Uh, and it says, learn how to make informed decisions regarding uh, the care of your loved ones. So how do we keep mom home if that's the uh, objective? Uh, there's a disclaimer that says that this is educational uh, this is not uh, advice that people can rely on and say, well, somehow, you know, I, I took this as gospel and I, and I relied on it to my detriment. Every situation is different. Uh, it's brought to you by the Empowered Living Club. I've mentioned that, the Empowered Living Club, and it's particularly appropriate that I mention it this, uh, for this session because the Empowered Living Club is, a, is the, uh, originally the Aging Solo Club. And it has been renamed. It has been expanded in its mission, expanded in its membership. It's been renamed. It's now called the Empowered Living Club. And the reason it's so apropos today is because our guest, who I'm going to introduce in a moment, Marilyn Wolke, is the person who helped us launch the Aging Solo Academy, uh, the six-week course that we did about uh, three years ago, I guess it is now, shortly before the pandemic. So this is, uh, Marilyn has been part of this really pretty much from the very start. And uh, we're welcome to, uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we are uh, happy to welcome her back today. Uh, so as I say, our expert today is Marilyn Wolke. Marilyn is a gerontologist. Uh, she, uh, as I say, is a master of social work and a certified dementia specialist. People in the Quad City region where we sent her are very, generally speaking, very familiar with Marilyn and her work. Uh, she worked with Alternatives for the Older Adult uh, and other organizations, uh, and she's run the support groups, et cetera, et cetera. So this is uh, right up Marilyn's alley, and um, uh, we're excited to have her with us uh, together. Uh, so, and as I say, the, the, the older care team, the, the usual suspects, we're here too. <laughs> Uh, as I said, it's a timely topic for today as well, because this is a topic that usually comes up around the holidays, particularly when people come back home uh, from out of town and uh, they see mom and they may, be, they may have not seen her for a year. It could be less than that, more than that, whatever, but, and there may be some changes. And so these types of conversations come up. Sometimes they come up with the family or family members. Sometimes they come up with mom or don't. And sometimes then they come up with, we get calls, okay? Uh, organizations such as ours uh, get calls in terms of, uh, I think we better uh, start thinking of things. So, uh, you know, as I say, it, as it says here, this, we, we may be at a fork in the road or we may be getting close to it. And so we need to kind of reevaluate the situation. And that's where uh, uh, this sort of discussion comes in. So this is really the first uh, slide or what I would call the meat of the presentation. Uh, and, 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 and that's a little misleading because this is not a presentation, it's really a discussion, but we have nine slides to help uh, guide us somewhat and organize us. As I said, uh, we had the Aging Solo Academy. It was a six week course, uh, two hours every week for six weeks. And some of the stuff that we're touching here, folks, uh, or that we're um, covering here today touches upon all six of those sessions. So trying to get 12 hours into one hour, we're, we're not really trying to do that, but there is a certain sense of that. 
Uh, and so this first slide talks about identifying your role, okay? Uh, what, are you a family member? Are you a caregiver? Uh, maybe you're not a direct hands-on caregiver, but you're a care manager uh, and you're in charge of mom's care. Uh, she can't do it for herself. Uh, the family member or caregiver slide. So the question here is, you know, how do you know what your role is? What criteria do you use and, and what choices do you have? Um, so let me just take a quick look here. Uh, and at this point, I would say, Marilyn, um, what's what's thoughts does this slide bring to mind for you what do you think is um most uh, urgent for our people to know well <clears throat> right off jamie and hello everybody i'm marilyn right off i was thinking about the slippery slide which i think maybe you're acquainted with that maybe you hadn't thought about before that you're a caregiver you've been a family member and gee you see mom you know maybe every day or a time or two a week and you don't stop to realize that in the meantime, you've been helping her with her finances and paying her bills because you found a stack of them. Or maybe you realize she wasn't taking her medicine right. So now you're helping her to, you know, to uh, distribute her medicine, dispense it. And so there's also that slippery slide of being just a family member and then suddenly realizing you've been a caregiver for quite a long time. Yeah, I think that's true. I, you know, there's that old, uh, that old example that's given, uh, they say, you know, if the frog jumps into a, a kettle of boiling water, it's going to realize it and it's going to do its best to jump out. Whereas if you put it in uh, just a, a beaker of water and you gradually heat it, uh, you might end up boiling the frog to death because it never realize, recognizes when the change has happened and, and when things have, have changed. And that's pretty much what I'm hearing you say is that a lot of times these these boundaries change over time rather slowly and rather subtly exactly yeah so um criteria to uh decide it says um uh pretty much you know uh, activities of daily living uh so identifying your role we have this and, and i think marilyn you can uh, develop this just a little further once a family member is really in need of, of help with the activities of daily living, your role pretty much has changed. Is that what you would say is kind of a succinct answer to that question? Uh, yes. I know when you and I first talked about this, that was one of the things that I brought up. I was, yes, we are covering that. Uh, and so that's, to me, when you have to start helping your parent or your loved one with these activities of daily living, for, for example, dispensing and taking their meds and getting a shower every day and eating their meals and take, they, those are the ADLs. Once you have to start doing that, then you are definitely a caregiver. Right. So, so talking about that slippery slope that we talked about or that gradual change, um, you know, we did a session uh, a few months ago on ADLs and IADLs, and we won't uh, uh, we won't um, recapitulate that here. Uh, and uh, you're all welcome to, to take a look at that. But uh, broadly speaking, ADLs, the activities of daily living are things that are the very, very basics of, 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 of daily living, uh, correct? Like feeding ourselves, bathing ourselves, toileting ourselves, dressing ourselves, uh, being able to ambulate or get around, that sort of a thing. Exactly. And then I'd like to add one more. What's that? It's a, a very big safety one. And that is, do they know how to call for help? Ah, yes. You know, they do they remember 911? Uh-huh. And That's... I've had clients before that I had to tell them, put 911 on mom's phone so she knows the dialect because she can't remember that number anymore. Well, you know, it's, uh, as I say, this is a, is a discussion. And it is to get uh, insights and perspectives. And so this is material that I recognize, but you have just provided me with a fresh insight in a way that I had not thought of these things before. And that is the safety piece as an, I, as an ADL, okay? We, we certainly know that if you're gonna leave mom alone, uh, that is she safe uh, staying alone? 
but we don't really characterize it as an ADL normally. Um, yeah, I'd like to add another one with that, and that is to check the medications. Yeah, yeah. That, you consider that thing. you consider that more of an ADL than an IADL? Yes, I do. Because if okay. they are taking them right, or they're double or triple, you know, if one is good, well, then two or three must be better. And a lot of your older people have that attitude. Yeah. So they yeah. might be overdosing themselves, or they might be completely forgetting to take a certain medication. And, and so for, for today's discussion, the IADLs are what we call um, the activities that kind of surround your ADLs. Uh, they're called instrumental activities of daily living. So I, I, can, I can ambulate, I can feed myself, but I don't do meal prep. I don't do grocery shopping. I ADL, uh, right. Right. I don't, um, uh, I can ambulate and, and do all those things, but I don't do house cleaning. I don't do mowing the lawn. I don't do shoveling the snow. Um, sometimes uh, the, the prescriptions are considered to be kind of I ADLs. And, and I think increasingly, I, I think things are going with the way you're thinking there, Marilyn. I think that uh, the, the dosage and taking the drugs is probably more of an ADL than, than an IADL because it is so important and it can right. really screw right. it up. And, and as you know, Jamie, I was a community case manager and we, we put that right up there with the ADLs. Safety okay. again, Just right? The safety. So maybe I can be left alone. Maybe I don't need 24 hours supervision, but nonetheless, I, I, I don't handle my financial affairs. Somebody else handles them. Or I can be left alone I, uh, you know, for periods of time. I don't have to have constant supervision, but I really need help in taking my medications. Maybe I can be left alone but if I've forgotten how to call 911, maybe I can no longer be left alone. We certainly see that uh, in, in the work we do. I know at one time when I did some training down in Tennessee in Nashville, uh, the rules in, that Tennessee had at that point for, uh, for the assisted livings was that all of their residents had to be able to get themselves out of the facility within 10 minutes, so that if you had a fire or something like that. Now, up here in the Illinois, Iowa area, generally speaking, if you've got sufficient staffing and a sufficient plan that you can get the people out, uh, they may not need to have that, that level. But if mom is staying at home and she no longer knows how to call 911, uh, or and can no longer get out of the house and or no longer recognizes the, the danger of a fire, um, you have a very, very serious problem on your hands. Okay. That really leads to a need for essentially 24 seven supervision right. of some sort. Uh, so this says, you know, needing the ADLs, what additional roles and responsibilities uh, could you take on? Certainly the IADLs. You might be doing meal prep or you might be taking mom meals. Um, might have turned off the, the gas to the stove or the electricity to the stove, right? Taking her laundry home to do it yourself because hers is in the basement. Yeah. yeah. Safety again. Doing the, the, removing the trash, helping clean, helping do the lawn and things like that. So what I gather from the discussion that we're having here in terms of the perspective that we're bringing to the table today is that uh, it's not unusual for a family member to go from a basically a social or an informal support role into helping with some of the IADLs. You know, uh, uh, mom doesn't, you know, go out of town. We make the arrangements for that. We take mom with us. Um, we help mom with some grocery shopping, et cetera, et cetera. But when you get into the, into the ADLs, the serious activities of daily living that are the, the most basic, then at that point, what I'm hearing you say, Marilyn, is that at that point, you really should consider yourself a caregiver. You own both, definitely. Okay. Should we go to the next slide? And was mm -hmm. that, okay, so we, we were talking about how do you know your role? What criteria do you use to decide? What choices do you have? Um, I guess that, you know, what criteria do you use to decide? Well, you've given a basic criterion there in terms of 
the need for ADLs. How do you know your role? What happens when there's multiple family members? Or what happens when you're out of town? Okay. Um, you know. I uh, think I think your first question or for your first comment was how, how many siblings do you have? Yeah. Like let's say those five children, okay, that's good. You think, oh boy, five children to help mom, but forgot to say four of them live out of state. <laughs> right. I found all the time. It usually fell the role of caregiving falls on a daughter. And usually the youngest daughter, because she's still around, or the one that lives closest. And heaven forbid that daughter be a nurse, because then for sure she's got the full load. <laughs> Right. And the full level of criticism or, or scrutiny. Yeah. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't have really time to get into that today. And that's a really separate discussion. But, but the family dynamics of, of, of the family caring for mom is a huge issue in and of itself. Would you agree? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Like I just said, you know, there, or is it just one child? Like, like I, I was lucky. I had a brother who lives in Northern Iowa. So I was it. And my husband was an only child. So we didn't have to decide, you know, who does what <laughs> we, we didn't have anybody to do that with. Right. So one of the things that we hear here is the, the phrase is oftentimes put, I want to be a daughter again. Uh, I, I want to be a family member and not and not just a caregiver. Or I'd really I'm exhausted with the caregiving and I and I really want to go into the family role again. Um, anything you have to say about that? Probably a lot, <laughs> but I think maybe it belongs to another slide because that's what I'd like to get in for the caregiver taking care of themselves. Okay. To allow yourself time to be yourself as well as time to be a daughter, not a caregiver. Uh -huh. Good. Well, self. let's go to this, this slide. It says roles of a caregiver. Okay. And uh, particularly when you're a family member, are there certain requirements or limitations? Are there what we call the traps? Uh, and um, one of the things that I wrote down, uh, just a couple of notes that I wanted to make sure Generally speaking, you can walk away. In other words, you have the right in terms of the rule system, generally speaking, to walk away if it's not something you can do or, or for whatever reason. However, in some places, there are uh, filial responsibility rules. So for instance, in uh, Pennsylvania, if mom is placed in a facility, uh, you as a family member may be called upon under the law of that state to contribute to her care. So there are some special um, uh, considerations. In most states, that is not currently uh, the rule. Similarly with, care, with family members, there is a, you know, there's a five-year look back for gifting. And uh, we're not going to get into that today, but if, if mom ultimately goes into, uh, say, nursing care, or if we try to bring uh, uh, Medicaid services into the home, there is that five-year look back. And if mom has, has given you money for helping take care of her, that may be construed as a gift, and it might, it might uh, disqualify mom or create some some issues uh, or obligations for you to perhaps pay some of that back. So it says here are the requirements for as a caregiver for a family member. And, and I would say from my experience that the biggest requirement there is that you treat it as an arm's length transaction. So not only is there the insult of, of not being able to be a family member as, as much as you were, but you're really forced upon taking a, a much more formal role than you might wish to take, even beyond the caregiving piece. Uh, so I, I think that that's um, uh, important. And I was struck by one of the statements that you made when we were talking in preparation for this, Marilyn. You said there are lots of serious consequences to being a caregiver. So yeah. what would you, <laughs> what, 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 
what perspective, what insights do you want, need to share with us at this point? You're hitting upon some of them, Jamie, and that's where people, anybody to me who is a caregiver of an older person needs legal help because there are legal ramifications like, like you are talking. And then, you know, if they need to go on public aid and how to do that <clears throat> legally and the like, so they need to talk to you. I think one of the main things I said to, <clears throat> I meant when I said that was burnout, caregiver burnout. And a lot of people don't realize that they are burning out and what it can do to the health. I don't know how many times I came across caregivers that thought they had to do it all or most of it all. And I tried to stress to them, you know, share, share the load, hire some help, get some help. And then the caregiver ended up dying before the care recipient. That happens. We've seen that, that a lot. It happens a lot. It does. Yeah. And uh, some again, sometimes it's that slippery slope. They're into it too deep and don't know how to get out and don't ha have too much pride to ask for help or don't know how to ask for help. So and one of the things that I'm hearing you say is that most of us have a tendency or many of us have a tendency to either disregard or underestimate the gravity of caregiving, uh, not only for mom, but for ourselves. For ourselves, mm -hmm. especially what I, yeah, what I'm referring to right now is for ourselves. Like I said, I've seen too many burn out or maybe I've even seen caregivers in denial that they are getting stressed out. I remember I had one lady when I visited her the first time here, she is taking care of her husband who had Alzheimer's and then she was taking care of two grandchildren. One I think was like kindergarten or first grade and the other one was like two or three years old. Mom was at St. Jude's Hospital with her third child who had brain cancer. So here's grandma taking care of husband with moderate dementia, a preschooler and a first grader. And I have no idea how she got that first grader to and from school. And I told her, you are stressed out. You need help. And she says, I'm, I, I'm stressed out. You think so? <laughs> <laughs> it's stressful just to watch from the outside, isn't it? <laughs> and so there was a woman who was in denial and there's a lot of caregivers who don't realize what they've taken on and what is taking of themselves. So would you say that it's one of your jobs and one of our jobs to try to sensitize people to some of these issues so that they can be more mindful about attacking these? Be more realistic about your situation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that probably is one of the central points that uh, of this discussion is, you know, your, your role as a family member versus caregiver, et cetera, et cetera. You, you've got some real, you need to be very mindful. Okay, it has serious consequences for everyone in everyone. many, many ways. Mm -hmm. And and I would reiterate, you know, in in uh, fifteen years of Golder Care and forty years of Elder Law, you know, prior to and part of that, uh, we have seen a number of caregivers literally uh, kill themselves. Okay, run themselves to the point where they die first, and. Uh, yeah. And it's and it's not it's not unusual. And for those who kind of get to the point where they have, like you say, they've they've gone down the slippery slope, they've gotten into it, and they think, well, I just have to get through this. And then whoever they're taking care of passes away and they think, oh, it's done. I'm I'm free of it. And I can't tell you how many people find that shortly after that that they may be ill or they may be or far, they may die. brittle. Right yeah. now, I got two in my mind that within a week after their care recipient died, my caregiver died. Within yeah. a week. Yeah. So when you're really working in the trenches as, uh, as you are, Marilyn, um, you know, you really almost can't overemphasize that, can you? Right. Like one of my ladies, uh, 
taking care of her husband and um, put off her own health. And this is what they do all the time. They think it's more important to take care of their care recipient than to take care of themselves. So they put off doctor's appointments or something's bothering them and oh, they just ignored. It's not that important. And this one lady, when she finally had a chance, I, she went to the doctor and she had cancer, advanced cancer. Too late to do anything. Oh, uh, because she waited too long to see the doctor for herself. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's. Uh, we're going to get even more into that uh, aspect that you're talking about there, Marilyn. There's a couple of slides I see that we have. Uh, this one here that Gail's brought up says a role as a family member. Uh, I think the point here is it's important to remember that your role as a family member is important too. And I and I take it, uh, you know you're you're very much there as well well you mentioned earlier too and that that also could be if you are the main caregiver you're going to get the probably the criticism from the rest of the siblings so you've got to understand that role too and try to get them informed as much as they can and involved as much as they can yeah i think that that when we talk about the mindfulness aspect uh, you know, and, and the issues with denial, uh, it's good to get everybody on board to the extent that you can. Right. Uh, and it puts a burden on the caregiver to some extent, because you're, you're, um, uh, you're accounting to the rest of the family, you're being transparent, you're being authentic, and you're you communicating, and as you should be. But it's an additional piece. So not only a, is part of your role as a caregiver to take care of mom but part of it is maybe not to take care of your siblings but to communicate to them what what they need to know what's going on with mom right you with that right. and try to get them involved i had and i wish i still had it so i could i've shared it with you i used to have it was a list of things things you could do to help me like for example Let's say I'm doing all the caregiving when my brother comes in, my brother says, well, if there's any way I can help you out with mom, let me know. Oh, okay, I will. <laughs> That's like throwing the basketball at me, but landing it in somebody else's yard and I never get it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so what this was, was a list of things. Oh gosh, at least 20, 30 things of, the, of what other people could do. Maybe it's come and spend three hours once a week with mom. Sit with her, talk to her, share stories with her, show her pictures. And that three hours is three hours of respite for you, the caregiver. But it was on the list. And what I would tell my caregivers do, to do is check two or have, have your other family member check two or three things that they will do, that they can do to help you. And then that way they are committing to doing something and you feel more free in asking. I love that idea. It, 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 what it brings to mind for me is I know that uh, churches, when they're looking for raising money and there's certain things, they will often prepare a wish list. You know, mm -hmm. we, want a, okay. uh, we want something in the garden for this, or we need something in the sanctuary, or we need something painted. So we need people to, do, to, yeah. to donate time or money. This is yeah. really that same concept, isn't it? It's yes. a wish list of things that can be done that are concrete, that are not um, uh, oppressive, and, and yet will we'll do a lot of help, a lot of yeah. good. Yeah, bring in dinner once a week, or come make dinner once a week. Little things like that. Do the laundry. Take it home and do the laundry and bring it back all cleaned and pressed. And like I said, there was at least 20, if not 30 things on that list. So if you had a family who was kind of locked in uh, whatever you want to say, kind of frozen in place, uh, do you think it would be uh, appropriate for a caregiver to say, you know, hey, I came across this list and here are some things that, um, uh, you know, that I certainly would appreciate if, if, if people would step up to the plate once in a while. Here are some things that you might consider doing. Uh, and you think that might sometimes break the ice? In those? I know. I know it would for me. I know it definitely would for me. And it can even be some long distance things on that list too. Like I remember having one client like a thousand miles away from his mother. And so he called her beautician 
and paid for her to have her hair done by the beautician once a month. Can you know, can you guess what that meant to mom? <laughs> yeah. I thought that was the most beautiful thing for a son to think of doing for mom. Yeah. That I, that's a great idea. I, yeah. I, I like that a lot. So uh, two things I would say here in terms of your role as a family member. Uh, one of the points that was made in the Aging Solo Academy is we talked about informal supports, friends and family and neighbors and whatever that provide some of the socialization and things like that. That's important. And certainly your role as a family member, it's important to serve as that, um, as that um, informal support. Um, and, and certainly going along with that, the socialization aspects are vital. Yeah. Not only for mom, but for you as well, going along with what Marilyn's talking about and burnout. So you don't want to overlook the amount of socialization you need or the amount of socialization mom needs. Um, I, I, for me, those are the primary or the most important aspects in terms of our roles, family members. What do you, what would you say to that, uh, Marilyn? Yeah, I'm thinking right off as a dementia specialist, I can tell you two ways to slow down, I can't say prevent, but slow down uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. Number one is to remain active physically, and number two, to remain active mentally. And so the more the family members can keep mom and or dad active, busy, doing things, not just sitting in front of the boob tube all day watching shows on television, but actually being active, whether they're going out for a walk or for a ride or going out for lunch at their favorite bar, whatever, keep them active, keep them doing something other than just sitting all day. And engaged as well, would you say? Engaged, thank you. One of my favorites, I hope you don't mind my mentioning it, is adult daycare. Yes. I, I worked at the one in Illinois. Um, after I retired, I still wanted something to do. And so I worked at the one in Illinois for two to three days a week. I loved it. Yeah. It was my, my favorite job ever. Just be mingling with these older folks and talking with them and making them laugh and smile and, and playing games. And... We saw them respond. My office was near the front door. And so family members would be going by all the time. And so often they stop in and say, this is shortly after they started they, their family member attending. They stop into me and say, I don't know why I didn't have mom come here earlier. She is so much better physically and mentally since I've started her here. Yeah. So that's, I want to put in a big plug for, for yeah. adult centers. It is. And it gives the caregiver some they respite to, yes. to do some self-care, to get their errands done, to do what's needed to, to rest from. Mm -hmm. uh, in that. fact, another, at least at the one in Illinois that I loved was uh, they also gave them showers there. And yeah. so let's say that was a big battle or you, you were uncomfortable take, you know, comfortable taking care of dad or mom in that manner. Well, <laughs> have it done at the adult daycare. Yeah, that's a that is a huge, huge um, uh, plus uh, for that, and I, and I don't know who came up with that, but that it was a brilliant move, yes. and uh, I, I think it's it's um, a really a godsend. Uh, potential pitfalls: What mistakes can I make? Am I at risk? Blah 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 blah. To take on the caregiver role, I think we've covered some of that stuff already. Uh, we've talked about you know going from a family member to being. Uh, a caregiver and then a caretaker and to becoming maybe even an employer. If you're hiring people to come in, uh, you may be taking on uh, the role of employer and that um, we're not here to discuss today. Uh, do we, we have a quick, do we have a quick minute that I'd add something there? Yes, you may, please do. Okay, lots of times I'm working with caregivers, I would, get them to agree that, yeah, it would be nice to have an outside like homemaker or whoever come in. Then they would have their choice of hiring one on their own or going to an agency. I personally perform, prefer the agency. Number one, if you hire, let's say somebody, you know, down the street and they get sick or their husband gets sick or the kids get sick, guess what? You're out of anybody helping you. Right. 
And number two, in case there is anything like any accidents, you're helping them uh, walk and they fall, are you liable? If you break their most expensive lamp, are you liable? So also all of that is taken on by the agency. All the insurance liability is taken on by the agency. So you don't need to worry if anything does happen. That's their job to handle. Yeah. Uh, there's more we, reasons of that, but there's my two main ones and, and hire through an agency. Yeah. And so, and I appreciate your, your, as I say, your insight here and your experience because that uh, dovetails exactly with, with ours as well at Boulder Care. And, um, and I think we had a session, uh, was it a month or so ago, in which we went even a little deeper into some of those pitfalls and, and how we would avoid those. Another pitfall, another common one that I really don't want to get into too much today, but to consider is not only might you be a, a, an employer if you go the employ them yourself route, as, as Marilyn was so eloquently discussing, but uh, at some point you might be asked to become a, an endorser or a guarantor uh, of costs for your parent. And that's a whole different that's a that's a whole different realm, uh, and that's another pitfall. And we can talk about that for probably a whole hour. But that is a potential pitfall that uh, can happen as you move from being a family member to a to a care uh, giver or at least a caretaker, um, care manager. Okay, this is one of the things that Marilyn has been uh, really pointing toward is avoiding caregiver burnout. So Marilyn, kind of take it from here, says, what is it? How can it be prevented, et cetera? <laughs> um, like the name in, in, is indicating, it's, it's when you feel overwhelmed. You are the caregiver and you've taken on more than you thought you were going to be taking on and you have become overwhelmed. And how do you get out from it? Because when you're stressed, you, you don't feel good. You know, it, it can physically and mentally destroy you. Uh, you don't take care of yourself. You have lowered immunity. You don't take care of yourself emotionally. Uh, so you can have burnout and there's lots of ways to prevent it. Number one, I've been saying it all the time, get help. Don't think you got to do the whole job by yourself. You ask for help and it makes you a better caregiver. The thing I like about it is when I had help come in for my mother-in-law, it allowed me to be her daughter-in-law again. Not her caregiver, but her daughter-in-law again. And I, I really enjoyed that rather than thinking I had to be on demand call to her all the time. And I um, assume your mother-in-law enjoyed that too. <laughs> I think she did. <laughs> she, yeah, she doesn't have to listen to me anymore. So I think it's important to know, you know, like golder care, know where to turn for help or respite where to go for respite does everybody do you think know the meaning of the word respite well why don't you explain it it's relief for the caregiver it's physical mentally mental relief for the caregiver it could be anywhere from like a couple hours to maybe a week to maybe a month <laughs> right right now uh, i know a gentleman who's um what would it be any, anyway, his sister was taking care of his mother full time, full time, and she has burned out. And so now she has asked him to take mom for two months. She says, I need a big break. Can you take mom for two months? Well, yeah. And that's why she is so burned out. At least she's smart enough to realize that she needs that much. But sometimes it can be a short time because I remember one time having a lady that, that, there is respite funding available through your, your agency on aging. And so I got her some of it and she just got enough money. So every Sunday she could go to church and they have lunch with her friends after church. And that was worth the world to her. It's like three hours, I think, but she got out and away and had that break from caregiving. Yeah. Yeah. Respite. There is another slide, I think, that goes along with what you're talking about. Uh, yes. You want to address this. Yeah, a lot of times people um, don't realize that they are under st stress until they t sit back and take a look. And so your caregivers that are watching this now, 
need to look through it. Earlier, I gave the denial of the woman who was taking care of her man with dementia plus two grandchildren. She was in denial of being under stress until she was faced with it. Um, a lot of people don't stop to realize that maybe the reason now that they feel anger and irritabil irritability is because they are wore out. They're tired. They don't have the patience anymore. And that just hits number three. Very often, a lot of times, the caregiver withdraws socially. They stop yeah. going to church. They start going, stop going out to, you know, for lunch with friends. They stop uh, shopping, you know, taking a couple hours to shop or get their hair done. They are socially withdrawing and that's not good for anybody. Uh, you can go down the list yourselves and see it. Exhaustion, sleeplessness go together. When you are a caregiver, especially if you are a 24 seven caregiver, you don't sleep well. You've got one ear open all night. That's what I was just thinking you were going to say. Uh -huh. It's like having a baby. It is very much like having a baby. To, to listen, are, are they getting up? Did they fall out of bed? Do they get up to the bathroom? So you never, I've been there, as you can tell. You never really get that good sleep because that one ear, like you said, it's like having a baby and listening for them all the time. And therefore, it feeds into the last two, nine and ten. Lack of concentration is harder to remember what to get things done and stay on task and leads to health problems for the caregiver. The last one. Yeah, I, I would I would go along with that kind of like your lack of concentration. Uh, if you become stressed and and emotional about it, it's hard to make good decisions. For sure. Yes. It's not only hard to concentrate, it's hard to remain mindful mm -hmm. it's hard to remain rational and on the you know on on the even even keel yeah it, sometimes it, you operate on a knee-jerk reaction yeah. oh this needs to be done you know and go do it without thinking it is there a better way to do it is there another way to do it yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. there take a look at that now marilyn what would you say to that <laughs> I'm 100% behind this. In fact, I know where you got this. I think I told you this. Three things, education, education, education. Number one, the first one, I mean, education about the disease. What, what is, are the actual health problems of your care recipient? What could happen? What should I be prepared for? Let's, let's say it's dementia, and right now they're in moderate dementia, and you're still learning how to handle that. But you know what? They still have another stage or two to go. Do you know how to handle all the behavior you are encountering and, and all the care that you have to take on because they can no longer do things? So get educated on the disease. Number two, and I, I'm pretty sure your people are doing that, is uh, to get educated on resources, resources in the community. I mentioned adult daycare as an example. Um, and different help that is available in the community. Uh, different groups. Uh, we've got KSI in Scott County here and, and alternatives in Rock Island County. We have all different agencies that all around that provide respite and things like that. And then my third it, one on education, I can wrap up in basically safety. Learn, learn safety, not only for your recipient, but for yourself. Um, learn things, practical things such as if they can't pick themselves, if they can't stand up anymore, do you know the correct way to help them stand up so that you don't end up breaking your own back or falling on the floor or down the steps with them? So it's education again in all safety matters as well as financial and legal problems. Okay, so there is a lot of education. Okay. A lot to learn. You know, when, when people have a baby, I compare this quite a lot. When they have a baby, there's so many resources available for the family. The doctor has information, probably his nurse does. There's probably programs at uh, your hospital, there's programs at your community college or whatever on having that first baby and what to do and what to expect. Where can you go for education on taking care of your parents? Yeah. When I fell into it and I fell into it, bango, 
I had, I didn't know what to do. I was totally, totally overwhelmed. That's and when I you had... went back to school and became a gerontologist, <laughs> wasn't it? You know that story. <laughs> so not everybody has to become a gerontologist. No. They need to know how to access that. Exactly. You know, as you say, you need to know the resources and you need to know the portals that you can enter to get to those resources. Yes. Would you agree that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, used to be that, um, and a number of people have heard me say this before, used to be that professionals, you know, information, whatever, professionals, uh, would sometimes, uh, when, when the internet first started and people would come into the professional's office and say, well, I read on the internet that thus and such, the professionals were somewhat uh, insulted by that. Today, it's a, it's a different world we live in. And I think everybody presumes that you're going to go to the internet first. Uh, Gail and I attended a wedding a couple of years ago up in Minneapolis, and the clinics had a large uh, uh, sign boards or bulletin boards out there. And uh, they said something to the effect of consult Dr. Google and then see us. <laughs> And I think that that's, I think that's where things are now. I mean, everybody goes, or most people go to Google first, but then you have to know what professionals, what resources right. uh, are available to help you interpret that and, and see. We all know you can't it. trust Dr. Google all the time. No, that's for sure. Right. And there are some things that are literally un Yep. Okay. The other thing that we say at the at the Golder Care side, where we do what we call total patient advocacy, is is that there are a lot of different rule systems. So you're talking about the rules of uh, adult protective services, doing it right. Uh, what rights does mom have? What rights do you have? What authorities do you have? So you have that legal system and and um, the powers of attorney and all of that. You have, if you're, if you're going for, um, uh, for help with getting care uh, and you want to get into public benefits, you have, uh, in our area, you have a, a difference between uh, VA and the different VA programs have different rules. Medicaid has a different set of rules. You've got Medicaid for uh, nursing home. You've got Medicaid for in-home care or community care. You have a difference between the two states. So you're really, we say that you're, you're navigating a, a maze that's built on top of a minefield. Yes. Would you agree with that, Marilyn? Well, and, you, yes. and so that's why Dr. Google can take you so far and various resources can take you so far. But you need to know the portals you need to enter. And and the other professionals need to know, okay, well, when I'm getting to the outskirts of how I can help you, you may need to see so-and-so, okay? So as, uh, you know, as Marilyn is saying, you know, you've got somebody like Marilyn, you may need, oh, adult, you, you may need adult daycare, or you need to know what the resources are and, and who to see and who understands it and who can help you. Well, have a resource who knows the resources. For example, yes. I can remember when I did community case management, there were a couple of times I called you for help. Yeah, right, right. So, mm-hmm. and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So, so yes, you do. Certainly, if you're a professional in the field, you need to know where the resources yes. are so that you can help your people get them. Yeah. Yeah. And we've always told people that uh, one of our promises, uh, this is not about us today, but one of our promises has always been if you call us and we can't help you, we promise to help get you where you need to go. We will steer you in the right direction and make whatever referrals uh, we think are appropriate for you. So you can mm-hmm. go on that journey and kind of zero in on the target. So mm-hmm. this I think is the last um, of the, of the um, uh, meat uh, of the presentation uh, slides. And it says, know your long-term goals. Are, are you really trying to stay home at all costs? Uh, would you consider placement if it's if it's necessary? Um, would you? I know you have some thoughts on that, Marilyn. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody. <laughs> when I was going to school and getting my gerontology degree, the big emphasis at that time was age in place. 
and helping that older person or person stay in their home and age at home. So you bring in all the resources such as meals on wheels and homemakers and fi even financial managers can come in. And I was all for it. Now, I think I mentioned earlier, I live in a retirement community where um, we have assisted living, independent living, assisted living, memory care, and then private homes or cottages around the outside where, where I live. And I am seeing all the benefits of socialization and activities. I'm seeing all these people in assisted living and independent living attending activities almost all day long. And I see them so much healthier and so much happier than those people that sit at home by themselves. So I have now changed my mind. I'm now a big proponent of, oh, I mentioned adult daycare earlier which is socialization and activities. But I'm also now a big proponent of looking into assisted and independent living. They are sometimes pricey, but I think it keeps the person healthier, both mentally and physically, as well as emotionally. There. <laughs> well, I think that uh, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think that's been an evolution of thought, not just for Marilyn Wolke, but within the industry as well. Yes. In the old days, we used to say, "What's available?" Well, you could go to the you can go to the to the rest home mm -hmm. or the old age home. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, you mentioned alternatives, which is one of the local agencies that helps people that you work for. It takes its name from you know there is an alternative mm -hmm. to having to just go into uh, a, an old age home. Right. And, and what you describe is, is really, you know, so you have an alternative, you could stay at home, and now you've really taken it on to the next step beyond that. And that is a really reformed system of supports where you have moved into a home within a large community. And so you, you have, you, you meet a number of those, uh, of those desires but you don't lose that socialization right. and the uh, activities and the kind of the guidance and the oversight and all of the things that and conveniences that that brings. Right. So I, I think you're, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. And I think it's, it's largely been the evolution of, of, of the system. Uh, it, at this point. it has been. And when you, when you think about it, <clears throat> look at all the growth right now of all the assisted independent living facilities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, they're not just little small homes anymore. They're big places that- <laughs> Right. Yeah, you you, you, you look them. and you say, are there that many people? <laughs> <laughs> well, the baby boomers are there now. The baby, baby boomers, boomers, you know, are- It's an their explosion. Stuff. It's mm -hmm. an explosion. Yes. That's happening. Yes, my, my, my druggist one day, who's older than I am, was telling some of the people in the drugstore that he worked with, you know, well, there's there's 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every day. And the day I happened to be there, I said, well, yesterday was my day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there are a lot of baby boomers. Yes. And there are a lot of us. We're all, none of us are getting any younger. And so. interestingly enough, I know I'm getting off the subject, but something I've really noticed lately is the number of old elementary schools that are now becoming independent living. Yes, yeah. The baby yeah. boomers. <laughs> so I even have met one lady who now lives in the same building where she went to grade school, third grade. She says, I went to third grade. <laughs> so it gives you a kind of a, I don't know, a base or a, a comfort level. It's kind of like um, um, comfort food. Yeah, yeah. It's she comfort was very accommodation. So I guess at this point, I think we've gone through the main uh, body of educational slides. We have used 55 minutes or so. Do we have any questions? Oh, there's the slide. And hey, you're right on top of it, Gail. Uh, there's the slide. It's question time. Does anyone have any questions? Gail, you want to tell you, them how they do that? For questions, you have a couple of different options. You can type your question into the chat area, and I'll read the question to our presenters, or um, you also can, we can unmute you if it's something that needs to be 
spoken. It can't be just uh, typed in. And your, I, you are all muted. You may not have muted yourself, but I have muted you. Uh, you can unmute by holding down your spacebar key. Um, that is one method. You uh, and you, or you can hit the unmute. And let me see. I do have some comments. Um, oh, okay. They're um, basically comments of excellent. Uh, it was an awesome discussion today. Uh, from a couple of people, but no actual questions yet. So if you do have questions, please feel free to type them in. If you have questions after we're done today, you can always send them to GolderCare, um, either sending them to info at goldercare.com or elc at goldercare.com and leave your, your contact information and we can get back to you then with answers to your questions. And then if we have something we need to submit to Marilyn, we'll go ahead and do that for you. So I got one for you, Jamie. Do we have? Yeah, time? go ahead, Marilyn. Because I had this happen to me one time. Let's say you got a uh, neighbors, husband, and wife, and the wife has Alzheimer's or some sort of dementia. You know, because practically every day she comes over to your house. Now, the husband doesn't keep a very good eye on her. In fact, he even goes off to the grocery store, might be gone for an hour before he comes back to his wife. And in the meantime, his wife has come over to your house. Oh, boy. What do you do? Just that you mentioned to him that he shouldn't do that. But he says, oh, she's, she's fine. She never, goes, she never goes any further than your house. She's fine. But in the meantime, it's a burden to me. What do I do? It, well, you, you, you've hit two pieces to it, uh, Marilyn, as I hear it. Um, number one, one of the reasons she may be going to your house is because he has abandoned her temporarily, and she may kind of feel it as that. She may or may not. But that may be why she goes over to your house, and that may mean that you have now become part of the caregiving system, uh, actually the formal caregiving system to some extent, uh, beyond just uh, informal uh, supports, you've become a formal support, perhaps against your will, as you've indicated, yeah. and and certainly to your consternation, because it really makes it, uh, gives you pause as to when you leave your own home, uh, because you're the, you're the plan B, you're the backup, and if he leaves and you're not there, what is going to happen to her? The, the second thing is, in terms of his, um, we talk about the traps or the compliance issues or adult protective services issues. Yes. He, he is, that is a form, um, you know, we have to keep it in perspective, but it is a form of a senior or domestic abuse in this case, if you qualify mm -hmm. as either. Uh, it's not physical or sexual abuse. It's not necessarily emotional abuse. It's not financial exploitation, but it is uh, abandonment or, or neglect. It's a form of neglect. He chooses not to see it that way. And, and that's somewhat understandable, but um, what, I, I will tell you back a situation uh, that we find ourselves in. And that is, you know, I started Golder Care 15 years ago because I had taken, I was an elder law attorney at that time. And I had taken elder law as far as I could. And one of the things that you have in a, in a law office is you have to be very, very strictly, you have to keep confidentiality. So we would have situations come up where, where mom came in and she had a child, an adult child who was financially dependent, perhaps to the point of being financially exploitative of her. And she would complain to the lawyer and the lawyer would say, well, let's, let's call adult protective services and see if they can kind of help with this. Oh, no, 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 no. At that point, the lawyer's hands are tied. Yep. The client has said, do not tell anyone about my son. One of the reasons we have Golder Care is because at Golder Care, we are not bound by that same set of confidentiality. In fact, we are mandated reporters. So we then would tell mom, you're going to get Sonny Boy in here and we're going to have a discussion with him about just how adult protective services works. And if that discussion doesn't do the trick, then we probably are going to be talking to adult protective services. 
And you may be getting to that same point, Carolyn. And it may be you may have to get somebody else, you know, like like you know uh, somebody like myself or whatever, or or a friend in the field. You're probably going to have to get somebody else who brings a certain um, uh, formality or distance to the table and say, you know, we need to have this talk. Okay, mm -hmm. I hear where you're coming from. I understand it. Uh, you know, you're a good person. You're a good husband, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You intend well. But you are skirting regulatory and legal issues that you don't want to be skirting. And, um, and particularly on the Iowa side of the river, it's not unusual for, uh, for the Department of Human Services to stage a raid on the house mm -hmm. and carry off the family member immediately to a hospital uh, and for for uh, for evaluation, and then a placement is made. It's easier on the Iowa side than it is on the Illinois side, and that's going to vary from state to state. Huh. But at that point, then the family member, the caregiver, may be banned from seeing their loved one for a yeah. period of time. And we we have at Golder Care, we have been through that and trying to get that reestablished, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Your your neighbor is facing issues that he's in denial about, and he's expecting you to enable it. And at some point, you'll have to stop enabling. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's helpful at all or not. Yeah, I'm wondering. Do you think everybody knows how to reach elder abuse? Um, well, Google not it. <laughs> right, right. That's true. Right, in every state there is. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually, Jamie, we get calls. Um, periodically, and the scenario will be given to me when I'm doing the triage call, and it will be something that indeed they need to call Adult Protective now. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that is the first step, and then come see us, and we'll sort out the rest. Mm -hmm. And so we have provided them with that phone number because it's not always easy to find. It might be done under this agency, and they have no idea. So if they look up adult protective, they don't find anything in the phone book or on the Google. And right. but if they call us, we can direct them to the appropriate agency that they need to be talking to. You and, might sometimes show the elder care locator number with people. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And the other thing is, as you know, Marilyn, uh, every in every county is overseen under the Older Americans Act or whatever by a, a AAA, uh, an area agency on aging, okay? Right. And uh, oftentimes the area agency on aging is the one who controls the funding for the other, uh, the other providers such as alternatives or yes. here in the Quad City area, KSI or whatever. In fact, but, the elder care locator number is often the yes. area agency on aging. And, yes. and the, yes. the other thing that some of the cities have in this area, uh, they'll have a, a senior officer with the police right. department right. and that is specially trained. And I believe Bettendorf is the one that has the, the most active uh, person Here in locally. the police department. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they often step in in that situation instead right. of going through one of the other agencies. Yeah. But as, as I say, there is an overarching AAA for every county that you're mm -hmm. in. There is always a AAA that you can get in touch with, even if there's not a state department on aging. Okay. Uh, and AAA and a standing else. for area agency on aging. So you can always go, if you're on Google, to look for the area agency on aging, which is nearest to you. They will, if you don't have Golder Care or Maryland or any of these other outfits, uh, you know, you can always go there. That's kind of the, the plan Z, okay? They'll get you to where you need to go in those situations. Yep. Other questions? I have not had any other questions posed. Well, then should um, we go to our concluding slides? Is that what you're thinking? Our upcoming, upcoming events are on this slide. Um, okay. Parish nurse, uh, well, how they can help with aging in place, decluttering for fall prevention, home safety and accessibility, and activities to keep us active and social while staying at home. 
avoiding scams targeting seniors. And that one will probably be very interesting. There's a lot of scams out there. Uh, fitness for the aging person using physical therapy, occupational therapy, fitness training, and computer literacy. How do you reach the outside world with the computer if you didn't grow up in the computer era? Yeah, and it's 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 ironic that uh, I see people moving into assisted living and you have to get your stuff on an app. <laughs> so even in assisted living, so uh, computers aren't optional anymore. <laughs> but many of those facilities are also offering the classes exactly on how to use that app on right. your phone or your computer. I either have to be able to do it or I have to have somebody do it for me. So, uh, but that's the subject of that presentation. It's 10 minutes after we've gone over. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, you can send us any questions. And um, as I said, this is a series, uh, Perspectives on Aging in Place. I think this one was, was particularly interesting. Uh, I think, Marilyn, uh, you, you couldn't have offered more. It was, <laughs> it was just great. And I thank I you. Thank you. Uh, the only thing we could have done was go for another six hours. Maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've enjoyed it, Jamie. Thank you. That's for right. Me. That's right. So uh, it's always a pleasure. And um, uh, as I say, we're making these available on demand. So if you're interested in any of the list or any of the others, uh, make sure you're in contact with us. Uh, and I think they're being posted on the website. We're in the process of developing all of that. And uh, again, thank you. Thank Have a you. good day. And a happy Thanksgiving.